Embracer Group are still on a spree. They've been on a spree for years, and soon enough, they're just going to own literally everything. Because, yes, they have acquired yet more things, including Lord of the Rings. Really, they own a sizable percentage of the games industry now. I believe yeah. they're like they're technically they're larger than Ubisoft, and you know, I mean, in, in spite of that, though, they have had recent issues. New Saints Row game, not exactly well received. That's a really bad first step on your step to like on your path to global domination of the games industry. Yeah. And you release Saints Row and everyone goes because I literally googled it just there because I wanted to you know, uh, I wanted to get refreshed on the entire structure going on because it's like Deep Silver Volition and then Deep Silver and then Cock Media and then Embracer. So I was like under that like Cock Media, which they rebranded to Play On, I believe. Yep. Which is clearly supposed to be said play on, but it's plowing, plowing. And it was like the, the first headline I saw was Is Saints Row the worst game of 2022? And you're like, Good yeah, start to your world domination plans, boys. Good that's start. An achievement. And of course, I uh, was a Biomutant. Yeah, that one also wasn't. was a bit mixed it in was, its reception. Yeah, mixed, which is okay. You know, won't, yeah. won't, won't, won't rake them over the coals for releasing a mixed game. But it's when you get something that's the worst of 2022, you're like, Maybe, maybe you might need to slow down with your buying stuff, maybe, maybe. What was Hell it? no, because <laughs> we're going to start off by the real big ticket things, as you might know. So, Tripwire Interactive, they have made Maneater, mm -hmm. but maybe more people will recognize Killing Floor, course, yeah. Red Orchestra, Rising Storm. They've published Chivalry. Um, now, funny enough, uh, you may remember the whole John Gibson situation where, uh, I mean, yeah, he was just pretty outspoken with what he believes about things. And uh, that did not really mesh with a lot of the audience, including of, uh, you know, of, his, of his own games. So interesting enough, he actually will not have a role at the new Tripwire, but the board will otherwise remain unchanged and they will be under the Sabre um, operating group. Mm. And as for why, well, basically, good, strong teams, strong franchises in Rising Storm, Killing Floor, Red Orchestra, and Maneater, um, and uh, a few other things like that as well, like with uh, Tripwire having some publishing experience, that's also kind of use, uh, useful for them. Now, the other interesting group uh, to me really is Tuxedo Labs because nice. that's only a six employee group, but you may remember the game Takedown. Teardown. Uh, or Teardown, yeah. So voxel based, just insane destruction. Sold 1.1 million units on PC, which is pretty damn impressive for a team of six. Yeah, and that's with a 96% uh, positive reviews on Steam. So oh, yeah, it's awesome. That is very, like, 45,000 reviews, 96% positive. That's really... You could see why you'd want to buy them if you've got a couple hundred or a couple mil hanging around. Like. Yeah, and for the racing event, so Dennis Gustafsson, uh, who is the founder basically is a big old technical genius especially in yeah. the in the space of uh, of physics they have absolutely stunning technology teardown basically had no marketing support so imagine what it could do with some marketing <laughs> yep. also their voxel technology they believe can evolve into something now obviously we look at games like roblox we look at minecraft voxel based creation tools that kind of thing so you can see where they'd want to go there now, also interesting is the acquisition of Limited Run, because Limited Run have a few more things than you will have thought. Like, you may have just thought, oh, Limited Run, they do, like, uh, you know, Steelbook, Switch game releases and things like that for games that have got an already established audience. That is true. They do have all that expertise, which is very useful, but they also own the Carbon Engine, which is used to port retro games to modern platforms. Uh, it's used in Shantae and River City Girl Zero, so... Mm. This is, uh, number one, going into Embracer Free Mode, which is a new group of Embracer. And, I mean, fairly obviously, that's them getting more and more into the retro space. Yeah, which obviously makes sense because we talked about it before, but they have their Embracer Games archive. Yeah. So them and Limited Run are a great partnership for them going, hey, we're going to own all the video games at some point. We might as well treat them reasonably well. Because I know they, they had a, um, a press release on their archive recently and like they talked about some stats and you're like, Hey, that's that's pretty good actually. That's that's doing what no other company actually wants to do culturally. They're all interested in pure profit, whereas Embracer are like, yeah, we'll do this. Especially because you think of like Lars Wingerfers, the CEO of that is, you know, he uh, got his start basically. I think it was like his second start. I think he did something else, but it was basically you know selling physical games in the equivalent of like in UK, you've got your game or your GameStop, the equivalent of those up in the up in the the 
the Scandinavia up in that area. And I guess, wait, like that's that. So that there's like a little bit of a, almost like an element of actually caring about video games and the history of them there. So that makes sense. Although I do think this, I may be speaking a little bit out of um, not fully understanding. So please correct me. But I believe limited run aren't always seen in the best light for a couple yeah, of reasons. There have been a few yeah. more recent stories there. Yeah, they kind of get into a little bit of, uh, not necessarily anything bad, but a little bit of maybe the full level of competence isn't always there. But they get they pull the money in because of their branding and stuff like that. And they even opened a store there not long uh, ago. And because I remember watching, was it around the E3 era or the E3 era, E3 time of the year in June, and they had like Mega 64 produce this really cool uh, skit for them. But then everyone, I saw everyone chapping like limited run there, a bit of a bit, bit, bit of a noof. And there's a couple times where I think Embracer have misstepped with uh, a couple different, not like maybe acquisitions, but how they've handled it and how they've kind of went, oh, we've bought you, but you can just do whatever you want as long as we can siphon off some of the profit, whatever else. So I think I might, we'll see how that goes, basically. Yeah. See so how um, that goes. So there's also Sting Tricks who have been acquired. They are um, basically in uh, in the vocal processing space. Yeah. So I imagine that to be rolled into some sort of uh, music game related thing. Now there's another uh, company within PC and console gaming that they're not currently telling us for commercial reasons. So maybe the deal's not finalized. Maybe there's something this company has to announce first. Who really knows? And then I think the most headline grabbing thing, the Lord of the Rings. He's bought Lord of the Rings? He's bought Lord of the Rings. As you do? Yeah. So Middle Earth Enterprises has been purchased from the Sol Zenitz company who currently control rights to the literary works of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Now the rights held here are almost everything. So they have no ability to publish the books and there is an exception for long form television. So Amazon's ring of power is safe. I'm sure people are not happy with that, but... Uh, yeah, so the, the rationale here, I think, is pretty damn obvious. It means they have Lord of the Rings. They can do <laughs> Lord of the Rings things. They can make money by licensing Lord of the Rings, which, I mean, it's a fairly hmm. major fandom. So yeah. that's all quite massive. This includes tabletop. This includes video games, media production. Um, I believe, like, they could... They, they could actually do a TV show. It's just that it can't be a certain number of parts or like a certain length uh. or something like that. But it all is fairly interesting, right? So they've got motion picture rights, which I think is fascinating. Mm. Um, they've got merchandising rights, including hotels and restaurants. They have jointly controlled rights to license, uh, adapt, and develop Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit theme parks. Now, this is something that's interesting because uh, Universal are opening a third gate in the Orlando Resort. Um, and uh, so that's that third gate basically the initial lineup of worlds in that park has been announced, but I think it was like through some patents, through some stuff that was filed anyway, and basically the big rumor mill in the theme park circles. The thought is that some point beyond 2025, there's a Lord of the Rings world. So similar to how you have like the Harry Potter land and Islands of Adventure, something like that happening for Lord of the Rings. I believe currently the thought is, I think Rivendell and Moria maybe mm. are covered. So, who knows, really? Uh, also, live stage productions and uh, matching rights to adapt any other token authorized uh, literary sequel or prequel, including Cimmeralian and Unfinished Tales. So, that's all fairly massive. This is in line with some of what Embracer have talked about with transmedia narrative strategy. So, that's all interesting. I mean, Embracer just, I think they want to be everywhere with the things that they own. Yep. Um, I think as well, I mean, in a world where it's like, hey, it's the Lord of the Rings fantasy you always wanted. Gollum. <laughs> I have a feeling that there is more that can be done with this IP that has been done. Perhaps evidenced by the second game has mod tools, there is going to be a Lord of the Rings mod. Yeah, I feel there's like... There's hunger. The hunger for that will never, ever, ever die. And there's even... Because Embracer are so good with, like, the history of games, I imagine they'll just be like, hey, we own Lord of the Rings. Yo, EA... Can we make your games again, please? Please, all those ones that people liked, Third Age, all the other ones, please, can we have those? Come on. We'll give you some of the profit. Or even just go speak to, I can't, can never remember the name, but the developers who were on the, uh, what are you called, series, the Shadow of Border, Shadow of Warriors. Oh, yeah. Just talk to those and go, yo, dude, I think. can't remember, but you go do that again, please. Like, yeah. I think people would, That maybe that design as it stands is a little bit dated today. 
but you could see people wanting like a newer version of that because you imagine even in the sense that obviously they're not that big a studio but the idea of something like insomniac spider-man but lord of the rings like that, that, there's there's eight to ten million sales free free yeah completely free yeah now embracer free mode this is a new uh, operating group their eleventh operating group, good and stuff. Yeah, they're fairly interesting. So they have uh, a focus on retro classic heritage gaming entertainment, game development and production, <laughs> devices, gear and collectibles, community and e-commerce, new idea and technology incubation and production services. And there's a few other acquisitions as well. So we've got Tatsujin, who are actually their first Japanese studio. Yeah, this is really interesting because this is like a load of classic shooters that people, like, like some ups and scrolling shooters that people don't really... Okay, maybe it's a bit rude to say people don't really care about them very much, but niche. they're super, super niche. Yeah. They're super niche even in the realm of classic shooters, as far as I understand. And they're just like, yeah, we'll just buy the... We'll, we will literally take the dude who's currently like holds all licenses and controls them and say, hello, we've bought you. There you go. We've bought you. We we own all your stuff. You can stay. You can run the place. And then, hey, we also bought this studio called Bitwave Games, and they do that kind of stuff. So we bought you. We bought you. Can you see all those games you're licensed to? Can you put them on PC? Or like, hell yeah, that's a load of classic games that were gone to the the ether that people have an interest in, even though it's niche. Like it, yeah, fire them on PC. Yeah. What's what's the harm? Surely we'll make at least some money. And like, this is for for a, for a company of that size for them to not go all in on one form of massive profit, but instead to go for the wide approach of hell yeah, we'll just have everyone, we'll just release niche games on PC. Or, yep, that's the way. That's the way. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's also uh, Geotech, who are a European peripheral producer, <laughs> who uh, they I think want to collaborate with, um, you know, other sort mm. of embracer. Yeah own groups and they've also then shuffled in uh game outlet europe clear River games quantic lab uh who <laughs> not, were... to be, not to be confused with quantic dream <laughs> yeah and quantic lab they were in the news for that whole uh, cyberpunk drama oh, a while yes. back uh, c77 entertainment who are a swedish game studio with some AAA roots but uh, no release titles and then grimfrost who are uh, basically a sort of swedish uh, like viking themed clothing and accessories and kind of like brand, they also work in supplying for TV and film. So, fairly interesting situation, actually oh, yeah. being ran, uh, this new operating group by the VP of Hardware from uh, Activision Blizzard. Mm. He oversaw things like Guitar Hero and uh, Skylanders. So, overall kind of interesting stuff. And then when we take a look at the acquisitions that they've made and we try to work out what their plan is, well, there's a few interesting things here. Number one, limited runs uh, Carbon Engine. So that's one really good thing to acquire. And also the voxel building tech from Teardown, which seemingly could be deployed into significantly bigger things. Perhaps the sorts of things that investors get very, very excited by. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, massive amounts of IP, not just Tripwire, also Lord of the Rings. That's yeah. insane. That's a big push into retro gaming as well. Um, and uh, as, as they put it, self-sufficiency within the within the production model. They basically just, you know, the whole chain, they own it. Yeah, and that's that's a, just a generally smart thing overall for business. It is like, it's just a shame that they continue to make a little bit of uh, kind of scuffed, scuffed decisions here and there, to be honest. Because I... I it's weird to not see this as terrifying. They've mm. made just enough right moves in the PR and stuff that I'm like, you know what? This actually seems really crazy positive to me. Assuming it actually bears out correctly. Especially because they have that focus on all of their operating groups just operating independently and like doing whatever they want. It's a lot better than the day of, you know... Because that's the thing people will always compare to like the, like the heyday or the past of studio acquisitions. Which is... The more recent past is Microsoft buys a load of studios and then they say, you can take as long as you want to make your games and then no games come out. That's one of the, that's one of the, I think, the, cur the current most recent one. But then you go a little bit further into the past and everyone's going to think EA. Everyone's going to think the pre-Series X and Series S Microsoft, which were, you know, oh, hello, studio. Having financial difficulty? 
we'll we'll we'll, we'll take care of you and got you but everyone <laughs> everyone just knows they have the gun behind their back yeah. just waiting for you like the very first second you make less than enough profit which is arbitrary we made up gone the i guess the square enix approach to the west as well yeah but now it's like embracer going yeah we'll buy you you can do it if you want as long as long as, as long as you, we make some profit yeah and like other things like may have forgotten like they own dark horse now like dark horse comics yeah. there's a lot of ip there they say um that they're trying to adapt video game franchises to board games and comic books they're really trying to be cool. everywhere. Look at this. We're actively pursuing partnerships with established industry players to bring more of our IPs to film, TV, and streaming. Like, they're going massive. I, now, see, this is interesting because, say, video games, you know, video games, comics, tabletop games, sure, all of that. As soon as you go film, TV, and streaming, I go, no, 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 no. Please, please actually consult with people who know what they're doing because that's the worst way to just destroy game IPs so hard. Is hey, we've made it. We've made a TV show. Ha! Uh, hello, Resident Evil Netflix. It's like Ouch. basically there there are so few that are good that there are the exceptions that prove the rule. Is it what like Tekken, Bloodlines, Castlevania? Maybe everything else is just why have you done this? Why are you sucking the soul out of these IPs? So hopefully they have actually a good a good uh, a good idea there. Yeah, and on that it's it's kind of interesting what the Saber Interactive uh, CEO said, where he called Embracer the anti-consolidating consolidator yeah which i think is is basically what he's getting at is they're hoovering people up but maybe rather than sucking them dry they're then just giving them the resources they need and then they are hands off um it essentially seems to be that they want all of the ip and then to be pretty well vertically integrated with uh you know, teams that can kind of assist each other i guess one example of that maybe not going ideally well is the whole uh, debacle over the old republic yeah, which has been so moved bad. from asper media to another uh yeah to, to another one of their um, own studios which uh, is fairly interesting yeah that's the awkward part where they've thrown all this money into owning all these things and without looking at like i don't know basically have they had a pr win yet outside of we've bought loads of stuff because kotor was going to be a great win and then they kind of went hey double a porting studio could you make a triple a game and they said yeah sure and then they couldn't seemingly i think that's the that's the takeaway from from schreier and then obviously since row was like hey you're a pretty small studio can you make a like a, a modern triple a game and whatever happened to volition it's like clearly the answer is no clearly the answer is not hey we've got you know excellent writers we've got excellent you know design team with the game's fine by most marks it's fine ish but it's just not good it's not like this is maybe rude to say but it's like it's not like it was worth making because it was so at any part that was really good kind of like why is this here is this here for the sake of it in a way maybe maybe there's maybe something will come out and they were like under like insane pressure for a time and that's why it was undercooked or something but it's definitely just like they're not off to a very good start they're not off to a very good start but we'll have to see how how well anything good comes out of them i think that's that's the thing because when it comes down to all this stuff is really cool to talk about from the industry perspective and from the analysis perspective but right now for consumers at home listening they will just be like oh the people who made saints row a bad mutant and then what what what, what else eh. so the people so the big name that made those games and can't even make a kotor remake properly with a shuffling around are going to have lord of the rings that doesn't sound that doesn't sound very good to me I don't like that. And yeah. that's one of the problems they're going to run into when it's like, you can talk the talk, you can walk the walk, you can have all the money in the world. But if you don't have those studios underneath you that are operating independently, operating effectively independently, and being able to take your resources and turn them into great games and great experiences, then you're just... Not, like all, all of that is for nothing if it doesn't land home in the consumer's lap going, I would like to pay for your product, please. Which, obviously, like there are stuff like Dark Horse obviously prints money and stuff like that, but... It depends. It's yet to be seen how they, these operating groups actually work under really well. Yeah, yeah. So, like, for some of what's been said, I mean, there was a article in The Ringer by Lewis Gordon that was basically just interviewing a bunch of people. Um, I mean, here's basically the quote. This is from the CEO of Saber Interactive. Previously, the studio was simply trying to make ends meet, balancing a push for AAA while keeping the lights on. Thanks to the, to the buyout, uh, Karch barely has any worries. So... 
done right, it's basically just... I mean, a good example. Let's just say somehow uh, our game studio got acquired by Saber uh, or by Embracer. That would be very interesting. Very unexpected. <laughs> um, but it would mean, it, you know, in this context, we could just go make the thing, probably do it bigger and better and not have to worry about money. Yeah. Whereas right now, it's like, okay, we know how many months we have money that will last, but we need, you know... It obviously is sort of quarter to quarter. Yeah, the because that's yeah. just the nature of the beast. So done right, you take those stresses away from teams, and, and then, then you let them do their thing. Yeah. Obviously, we've had a few misses, but that's. I mean, yeah, we've had a few misses, but I mean, would they have been wins outside of Embracer? That's the thing. We will, we basically won't know that yeah. because you go well. So, technically, right, you go, okay, well, what does a company look like when they're removed from the financial stress of having to finish their game within a certain time frame or so, or someone else is going in? Then you go, well, okay, sometimes for certain people, the stress of a deadline, stressors of like, you know, it's a fire under your ass and it helps you actually work harder. That is true for some people, not true for others. Obviously, there's a lot of like problems that comes out of like extra stress, having health problems, all that stuff like that's all still there. But like sometimes you go, you take, you put a safety cushion down and then the team are just like, ah, oh, well, ah, since not that good, ah, oh, whatever. We'll make the next one good because they know they have that opportunity. Theoretically, of course, like, you know, uh, Deep Silver could say, what the hell was that? Get out. They could do that. But it's like, then there's also the side of like, you know, Embracer say independently, but there will be, you know, who's to say they don't have the people who are liaising with the upper management aren't the kind of people to crack the whip every now and again and go, oh no, we need we need to report better numbers because we are middle management and we want a promotion. So we want to be seen to have an impact on making you better. So then that's where like crunch comes from, where you go, okay, well, actually, you know what? It'd be really good if we got X game out in Y quarter. It would look really, really good for us. And the team are like, I don't think that's a great idea, but then they're shot down. And that stuff doesn't like, you could be, you know, the CEO of that management and go, well, that's never going to happen here. But it's not their decision to make, realistically, in the day-to-day. -day. It's once you get big, you need to hire more management, more, like, communication. And that's where that could start to go a little bit wrong. Or it could just be the case. They go, hey, what do you like without any financial restrictions within reason? And someone, like, especially when you look at, like, Teardown, and they go, oh, we can use this tech. I make a really big game. Holy shit, let's go. Yeah. That's what I guess that's that's why they invested there for that possibility. So it's just they will hopefully be just a shotgun of video games and some of them will be great. Yeah. Hopefully. Pretty much. It's uh, overall it's just it, it's interesting. We've I mean we've been tracking Embracer for years a while. Now, I, yeah. I think we got on that train before most did. Yeah, it was like yeah. It, it's been kind of incredible to see it just literally not stop. Lord of the rings wild there you go you can have a you can have crystal dynamics make a marvel's avengers but for lord of the rings sort it i mean if they <laughs> were going to do a tomb raider but for lord of the rings maybe we're talking yeah uh, i guess yeah i because i also forgot that they own them yeah, yeah, yeah. they own of course this all yeah oh my God, crystal dynamics so idols montreal yeah, Squirtix, montreal games. Deus Ex, this is probably Adam Jensen's only chance to exist again. Yeah, well, I think they said oh. they were happy. I think they said they were happy to, like, start working on one of those oh, ones they once did, they yeah. get the, the, the chance. So it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, maybe Deus Ex will get a good follow-up. Well, if you manage not to fuck up Lord of the Rings, and you manage not to fuck up Deus Ex, then it'll probably do pretty okay by me. So that, that'll also, those will be, like, those will be two individual miracles, but yes. Yes, yes. If you can do those miracles, then we're all good. So, yeah. basically, let us know what you think about this one. It's uh, certainly bloody interesting, to say the very least. See you next time.